Good afternoon, everybody, and a warm welcome to uh, this IC on recognizing glaucoma masqueraders, a multi subspeciality insight. So I'd request my co-instructors to please come up to the dais, Dr. Shumit Chaudhary, Dr. Shweta Tripathi, Dr. Shubrangshu Sen Gupta, and Dr. Anujit Paul. So OCT has revolutionized the way we treat glaucoma and treat progression in glaucoma. But however, although it has revolutionized our treatment and diagnosis of glaucoma, we need to know the pitfalls well to be able to not overtreat or undertreat our patients. So the first speaker this afternoon is Dr. Shumit Chaudhary. Dr. Shumit Chaudhary is perhaps the first glaucoma uh, consultant of East India who uh, did extensive work in glaucoma and is still going strong. He has been the president of the Kolkata Association of Ophthalmologists and uh, he is a consultant at BBI Foundation and Disha Hospitals at Kolkata. Over to you, Dr. Shumit Chaudhary, real disease. Thank you, Chandima, for giving me a chance for the OIC. And thank you, Aries, for giving me a chance for the platform. This is a real disease, the OCT interpretation. The rationale of the quantitative imaging in glaucoma diagnosis the visual field we all know that but visual field has poor repeatability as for the wood study it has been found that 86 percent of the abnormal and the reliable fields were not confirmed on retest we need at least three consecutive fields for to get a reliable field. But again, the controversy is there. If we go for the two consecutive tests of the abnormal and reliable test, it has found 66% are there. And when you go to say, three consecutive tests, it is down by the 12%. So number of tests, there is a discrepancy between the tests, but their results. So structural loss, which is the functional loss, we all know that. Again, the OAT study, it has been found the optic disc assessment, maybe you may be missing up to 55% of the glaucoma patient. So this changes precedes visual field loss in most of the cases. So what next? The rational retinal nerve fiber loss precedes the visual field loss by the six years in 60% of the patients. These are the, some of the studies. In old study, HRT showed the glaucoma test changes eight years before the visual field, 17% of the retinal nerve fiber loss before visual field detection. Progressive optic disc changes may not correspond to the RNF thinning in the same wise with glaucoma progression also. So what next? Next is OCT. We have the spectral domain OCT. In the OCT3, it produces 520. 12 A scans with 1024 data points. And the resolution time is 8 to 10 micron. New machines began to reach a resolution of 2 microns also. Image acquisition time is less than one second. Some of the older machines, the time domain is a sequential, is one pixel at a time. There's some fallacy at the very slow, where we can see the motion artifacts and it gives a 5 and 12 A scans in 1.28 seconds. And then now the newer one, the spectral domain, is a simultaneous one, 1024 pixel at a time, where you can see the small whistles also. This is the average written nerve fiber layer values at the 3.45 millimeter. Now the color coding. The thinnest 1% of the measurement falls in the red area. 
the thinnest five percent of the measurement falls in or below the yellow area, but the ninety percent of the measurements fall in the green area, and the thickest five percent measurement falls in the white area. So types of the renal nerve fiber changes. It can be the widening of the renal nerve fiber defects. It can be deepening of the retinal nerve fiber defect or development of a new retinal nerve fiber defect. Infrared temporal meridian is the most common in glaucoma. Compressive optic neuropathy has nasal and temporal defects and thinning. So rates of changes and age-related natural nerve fiber loss, average rate is influenced by the greater the breastline thickness, faster rate of changes. No significant changes in the nasal and the temporal quadrant. Highest progression rate in six o'clock section sector in the renal nerve fiber layer. Perimetric glaucoma has higher rates than pre-perimetric glaucoma. Now we have gone for the retinal nerve fiber layer. Something new, the macula area. It is very important because the glaucoma, the macular ganglia cell mapping is important because very early cases, these are being damaged. In the RTV F FD fluid domain OCT, the 26,000 scans per second is being done in the five micron axial resolution. And the ganglia cell complex, the seven millimeter scan area is being done where you can see the ganglia cell complex clearly and visibly. And in the right hand side, we can see the color coding of the macular thickness map. This is a glo glaucoma preferential thins the ganglia cells layer. It has been known and is proved. And the GCC complex includes the axon cells, bodies, and the dendrites of retinal ganglia cells. GCC measures the thickness of the three innermost retinal layers that are preferentially affected in glaucoma. It's a one to seven cells thick, less variable, contains 50% of the retinal ganglia cells. Average count is lower in eyes with early defects, but count can be affected by the drusens and AMD. This is a significant mapping. Again, the color coding mapping is there. Red shows the outside normal limits. Green, the baseline values within the normal limits. And the yellow is the borderline. If you go for the deviation map, again, the coding is there, color coding. Blue is the thinning of the 20 to 30 percent of the related to normal, whereas the black is a more than 50 percent loss or greater. This is the one of the picture with the color coding. Even in the SD OCT allows correlation of glaucoma disease pattern pre perimetric glaucoma also. Measurement boundaries. Different machine gives different boundaries. In the retina, inner boundary is the interlimited membrane for all, but the outer boundary varies in all types of different machines from status to top count to spectral and other. In the disc changes, same happens. These are the four types of machine we are normally handling nowadays. The Zeiss is a time domain, one of the oldest one, and the Zeiss Cyrus, Artiview, and the Heidelberg. Of these three, last three, of these three last one, you can find the Heidelberg spectral is give the 40,000 axial scans per second. It's a, it can find a very minor defect in the retinal nerve fiber layer. The database, the stratus of the database of 20, 20, 28 subjects, and of this 63 percent patients of the Caucasian and only 11 percent of the Asians. In the Cyrus, to 84 subjects. 43% of the Caucasian and 1% is the Indian as a database. Spectralists, 201 subject, all Caucasians. This is the average retinal nerve fiber thickness measurement from status, spectralists, iris, RTV, top count. All have the average between the 94% 4 micron and 200 micron. More or less equal. Retinal nerve fiber value, OptiView. We can see the four quadrant from the same like the INST rule as that of the optic nerve disc. In the nasal part, you can see the 56% in the temporal, a little more, 
in the superior part, little more thickness, and the inferior is the most thickness. This is the average studies of 2010. In the ganglion cell complex, the normal values are lower limit or normal values. Again, there's the average more or less. In the superior, if you go for the 76.69 and inferiorly 77.25. Again, the lower part is already always the thickest part. In the glaucoma progression, rate of changes varies from patient to patient. The morphological changes commonly do not match neither chronologically or in the magnitude the functional changes. And the lack of accurate reference tests against which the accuracy of new testing strategies can be assessed. And this is an overview of a patient from 2009 to 2013. Slowly there's a change, the red flag is increasing. Is a new glaucoma module premium edition of the Spectralis 2 Heidelberg. It's a glaucoma progression analysis providing comparison of the normal aging slow the green line. This is normal aging. And the rim or any of the retinal parameters can be selected looking at it changes globally, always sector. Just change these parameters, just give a round of the ring. It will show the change whether it's deteriorating or coming towards the green line or not. These are the changes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chaudhary, for that very elaborate uh, talk on detecting uh, glaucoma on the OCT. Please come and join us on the dais. We'll take the questions at the end of all the talks. Next, we'll move on to uh, pathophysiology of the optic nerve cupping from glaucoma, retinal, and neurological conditions uh, to be talked about by Dr. Shweta Tripathi. Dr. Shweta Tripathi did her fellowship in glaucoma from Shankar Netrale, and presently she's a senior consultant at the Indira Gandhi Eye Hospital at Lucknow. Over to you, Dr. Shweta. Okay. Yeah, now it's there. A very good afternoon to all, and thank you, Chandrima, ma'am, for having me a part of this IC. So we'll talk about and understand about the ONH cupping when it comes to the glaucomatous conditions or some other non-glaucomatous conditions as well. So before that, we uh, solve this conundrum. Let's have a look over the history of ONH, its association in the field of glaucoma. So that was far back in 1857 when Vaughan Graffy first described the association of ONH with glaucoma. And after that, there was progression till 1973 when the retinal nerve fibrillae association was established by Hoyt et al. And after that, as we all know, there was no looking back. So when we talk about glaucoma, the first thing comes in, um, in our mind is two things. One is the increased pressure, and second is the cupping. Though cupping is always known as a well-recognized feature of glaucoma, but yet, of course, it is not the pathognomic feature of glaucoma because there are certain other non-glaucomatous conditions like some ischemic condition, compressive neuropathies. So many things are there, some inflammatory conditions which lead to the glaucomatous cupping. So in all we can say, because these are the conditions where we need to uh, establish a well-differentiating feature, whether it's a glaucomatous cupping or a non-glaucomatous cupping. And when we go in the favor of the non-glaucomatous cupping, we have to look and focus on the signs of pallor. Because different studies have also established, like here, what one, one I have mentioned here is, like 44% of eyes by Trobi et al. showed that they were having actually the non-glaucomatous cupping, uh, uh, I can say the neuropathy. Cupping would be no, uh, not the correct word. It's a neuropathy who, who were misdiagnosed to have glaucoma instead of a non-glaucomatous pathology. So now we look at the pallor. We say that it's a subjective sign again. So that means subject to variation, and it will depend on the individual assessment also. So for that, to make a uh, established diagnosis, we need to go in the details of the history, which is going to be covered by my subsequent speakers. So with that, we talk about glaucoma once again. We come back to the pavilion and talk about the glaucoma neuropathy, which is basically because of the loss of the retinal ganglion cells where some pressure related or the pressure independent mechanisms, they do play an important role. And the end result is about the apoptosis, whether it's uh, any nitric oxide neurotoxicity or something else, which all lead to the death of the retinal ganglion cells. So now let's understand that actually what happens, how this cupping is actually occurring, whether it's a glaucomatous condition or a non-glaucomatous condition. For that, we need to understand the optic disc in three portions. One would be the preal and minor, 
second would be the laminar, and third is the vitro-laminar portion. So now, as we all know, it's written, documented everywhere, there are several million of uh, retinal ganglion cell exons which pass and they exit the eye uh, from an inner lining of, we can say, Brooks membrane opening, and outer covering would be the, which is provided by the scleral canal or the neural canal. Now, when it goes via this neural canal, the narrowing happens, and there, it, these exons are laden by, by basement membranes, pericyting, uh, pericytes covering the basement membranes, and connective tissue beams, all together, they are known as lamina cribrosa, where we have to focus on. So now, when we again come to this uh, particular pinkish color of the optic disc, which we all are aware of, it is basically because of the vessels supplying from the posterior ciliary artery. And this is the only visible part of the ONH which we see and uh, we say as o uh, optic disc. So now, uh, again, understanding uh, the blood supply of the ONH, only then we can understand that actually what is happening which is leading to that cupping. So we need to understand with this schematic representation of the lamina cribrosa, as we can see here, that there are capillaries surrounded by the basement membrane, estocyte, the extracellular matrix, everything. And these are the adjoining exons. Uh, these are the adjoining exons. So basically the diffusion of the nutrition, because anything to survive needs a nutrition. So for that nutrition, the nutrition comes from the basement membranes of the capillaries going to the estocytes and then to the adjoining exons. So for any reason, if there is damage, or I can say, and these capillaries are derived from the posterior ciliary arteries, which I've mentioned in the previous slide. So for any reason, if this supply is hampered, or I can say that any scleral stretching from where the exons is coming out, that is tarnishing the diffusion coefficient of the exons, definitely this is going to cause a retinal ganglion cell death. Now, again, again we come back to the blood flow once again. And here we know that the blood flow in the ONH is basically autoregulated. But besides that, we all know that in glaucoma, several other factors are fa uh, working together. So it could be a non-IOP related factor or could be an IOP induced factor. Anything which is going to affect this posterior ciliary artery is going to further affect the blood supply here, further leading to the death of the retinal ganglion cells. And this is what all happens. So now when we talk about the non-IOP related factors could be the fluctuations in the BP, and that is why besides IOP, BP fluctuation is supposed to be one of the important factors when it comes to your progressive glaucoma cases. Now any IOP induced factors, maybe even this compression of this, because here when it is coming out, here the posterior ciliary artery, if it is compressed in the neural canal, definitely that is going to have the uh, impaired blood supply. So now the basic part is, to understand the cupping, it can be divided into two components. One would be the prelaminar flow, that is the shallow form of the cupping, where basically it is only the loss of the retinal ganglion cells. And the other form, which is the most important form, and actually it is encountered in the cases of glaucoma, that's a deep cupping, that's a laminar thinning. Here, besides the laminar cribrosa, the adjoining scleral connective tissue, it gets hampered. So now, basically now we can say and we understand in a better way that cupping is nothing, it's just a manifestation of the neuropathy which is happening in the glaucomatous eyes. So now, uh, looking at this, uh, the, again the schematic representation of uh, the neural canal here, as we can see that this is the opening of the Bowman's uh, membrane, uh, sorry, Brooks membrane, and this is the reference uh, plane, and here we can see this is the anterior scleral ring. So now, in the shallow cupping, as we can see here now, the cupping we know, there, there are two types of cupping, the shallow cupping and the deep cupping. Now when we talk about the shallow cupping, here as we can see that all the damage is occurring anterior to the lamina cribrosa. But when we talk about the deep cupping, which is actually a glaucomatous cupping, we see that the adjoining scleral tissue, the connective tissue is also getting involved. And once damage occurs here, then this becomes more prone to sustenance or to any kind of intraocular pressure, which further leads to the progression of the cupping. So in all, we can say that even uh, any kind of damage which is happening here, it is always manifesting first in the optic disc whether it's a shallow cupping or it's a deep cupping. So now, again, when we talk about the glaucomatous cupping, now we, in all we can say that the progressive deformation and excavation of the tissues of the optic nerve head adjoining beneath the Brooks membrane 
and the anterior rim of the scleral canal. That is, as again we see here, that is the anterior rim of the scleral canal and beneath the Proux membrane. This is actually which is, happen which is what is happening in glaucomatous eyes. So now with that we come to the, some of the noun glaucomatous cupping as I already said. That could be because of the insult due to ischemia, inflammatory, or any compressive lesion. So now here the feature is going to be a kind of shallow cupping. That is the damage is happening. Yes, of course it is happening, but at the level of the retinal ganglion cells. It is not going beyond that and that is leading to the pallor and atrophy of the ONH. So now, uh, this is a I, a I O N, and so it's a non-glaucomatous. Now, if we see vaguely, we can say it's a glaucomatous cupping looking at the disc status, but actually it is not. It is the pallor which is preceded by an incidence of A I O N. That is an ischemic insult to the eye. And last but not the least would be this condition we should never forget whenever we are talking about a glaucoma or a non-glaucomatous eye. This is physiological cupping. Now, we come to some of the variations of the optic disc associations. And so only if we follow the five rules of an optic nerve head evaluation, we are never going to miss a glaucomatous or a non-glaucomatous cause of the neuropathy. Uh, some, uh, though I'm not going in the details of the um, uh, clinical conditions because they are going to be covered, but yes, some of the compressive neuropathies where we have to take a history importantly about the central vision acuity and the color vision because these are the things which are spared in cases of advanced glaucomas as well. Now talking about some of the toxic neuropathies, all are because of the mitochondrial dysfunctions. So yes, they are difficult to differentiate between a glaucomatous cupping, but only if we take a proper history, we can come to a conclusive diagnosis. And with that, I conclude just sharing some tips and tricks that only if we take a proper patient history, an algorithm can be set to make a differential diagnosis with a proper visual functioning, neuroimaging, and blood investigations if need be. So the take home message would be that diagnosis is seeing in totality. It should not come as a mirage, seeing and making a diagnosis. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Tripathi, for uh, explaining this in a such a lucid manner. Uh, we move on to the next speaker. I have the honor and privilege of introducing Dr. Chandrima Paul, the chief instructor of this uh, particular course. She is one of the very first uh, PhDs in ophthalmology in all over India. She was the past general secretary of uh, the Glaucoma Society of India, the president of the Kolkata Association of Ophthalmologists. Ma'am is the director of BBI Foundation. She's a key opinion leader in the field of glaucoma, but she's also an ardent pianist and uh, an avid debater right from her school days. Over to you, Dr. Chandrima Paul, ma'am, for speaking on glaucoma artifacts. Thank you very much, Shubrangshu, for those kind words. I see in the audience there, Dr. Shushmita Koshik. Can you please join us on the dais? With, you have extensively worked with the OCT, so please come up to the dais. It would be very uh, informative for everybody. So, uh, there are enough of chairs here, actually. Okay. Uh, so, this is basically a screenshot of Dr. Joel Showman's uh, slide at the GSI webinar in 2020, where he said that OCT abnormality predicts visual function conversion in glaucoma suspect and preperimetric glaucoma. Ganglion cell complex focal loss volume was the best predictor of visual field conversion in 513 GSPG eyes followed for an average of 52 months in which 82% of visual field conversion preceded by abnormal OCT and 23 plus minus 17 month lag between visual field conversion and OCT abnormality. So on that note by one of the founders of OCT, we move on to what we need to actually be careful about when we are actually using the OCT. So the factors affecting OCT scan quality. Patient dependent, we have the media opacities and pupillary diameter, operator dependent, centration, signal strength of acquired image, device dependent, acquisition speed, database related, and clinical paradigm of OCT scans. Coming to patient and disease dependent, pupillary diameter less than two millimeters, does not really give you a good picture. Cataract can diminish the uh, fineness of the OCT image. 
dry eye, def definitely you've got to take care of the dry eye. And the eye blinks which come in between in the absence of an eye tracking system, the acquisition process continues uninterrupted even in the presence of blinks. So you've got to be careful about that. I'll talk about those with uh, pictures a little later. So patient and disease dependent floaters. If you see there, uh, when a floatus is located on the scan circle, a vertical shadow of the signal attenuation interruption is there, visible in the corresponding area of the circular tomogram, and that can actually affect your OCT scan and give you a misinterpretation of what's going on. Effect of blood vessels, if you see shadowing, as you see out here, uh, shadowing on segmentation. Next come vessel breaks, as you see on the B-scan image, indicating uh, problems in scan acquisition. And uh, of course, segmental errors can actually reflect as artifacts, which uh, can mislead your diagnosis. So poor signal strength. So you've got to be careful what is the signal strength before you actually label a patient as glaucomatous. Something like this, as you see on your left, that is 34.8, could mislead a clinician. So operator-dependent artifacts include truncation of the acquired spectral domain optical to uh, coherence tomography image. That is, all edges of the image were not seen within the window, as you see out there. And the same image, when I show you here, see there is a drastic uh, change in your pie chart that you see, and even in the graph that you see, the double hump pattern and the rest of it. So misinterpretation of artifacts, localized losses of RNFL or macular thickness classified as normal due to averaging of the thickness values by quadrant or hemisphere, misinterpretation of shadow artifacts, and the red and green disease. So what is the red disease? Red disease is misinterpretation that occurs when a normative database is applied to patients who should not be considered normal, say as for example, people who have high myopia, where the RNFL by itself is thin, and all this uh, that you see on the OCT uh, graph pattern is actually because of that and not because of glaucoma. So you need to be careful of that. That's the red disease. And the green disease is there are certain focal losses which happen, which actually the OCT cannot predict because the OCT actually takes the average calculation of the thickness map. So these actually can uh, uh, confuse you and you can have a totally green uh, OCT there where actually the patient does have focal losses which are uh, not picked up. So red and green disease, high myopes, measurements tend to fall outside the normal range showing up as red. On the other hand, small focal areas of damage in any eye often show up as green because the instrument averages the thickness in a particular sector. So there's a need for taking artifacts into consideration when interpreting the data from these equipments. So device-related artifacts, absence of eye tracking system causes this not controlling of the head tilt, absence of robust segmentation software in the OCT, and failure to recognize non-glaucomatous disease, such as uh, my other speakers will be talking to you about, anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, retinal dystrophies, and hemiretinal vein occlusion, amongst others. So if you look at that misdirection artifact, uh, vitreous retina interface is misidentified as the outer surface of the retinal nerve fiber layer, so that could lead to a misinterpretation. And similarly here, false progression artifact, release of epiretinal membrane is noted. This is here, and then when you look at this, which creates a false appearance of progression that the clinician may miss. Then we move on to the masqueraders of glaucoma, such as neurosyphilis, optic dysdrusin, and optic uh, neuropathy which will be dealt by my subsequent speakers, so I wouldn't go into those details. So points to be considered, Clinch, clinicians must pay attention to the quality of the strength and the signal strength, factors that decrease signal strength, I've spoken to you already about, artifacts and data acquisition and segmentation areas. The drawbacks, artifacts and anomalies of the scanning process affect all the machines due to inherent drawbacks or limitations in the machine hardware or anatomical variations in the individual patients. So it's important to recognize the common sources of error and avoid them in clinical practice. These I've already spoken to you about. So progression of the, on the OCT is not defined unlike the case of visual field tests, and hence it has to be subjectively interpreted, keeping in mind the limits and resolutions of each individual machine. 
All OCT devices do not have the ability of fast grace track and alignment hardware and software for progression and so have a limitation on their use on follow-ups. So another challenge which often poses is the early glaucomatous change which includes the macula. So by the macula we mean the region of eight degrees of fixation which is only approximately 2% of the retinal area but includes over 30% of the retinal ganglion cells. Each macular damage is missed or underestimated by the OCT disc scan, especially if metrics such as global quadrant or clock hours is taken into account for RNFL thickness. So most clinicians use the disc scan. And the challenge too is here, in most of these cases, we say the OCT is useless when uh, in advanced glaucoma. But if you look at this, uh, where it shows that, you know, this 24 dash to visual field shows a re region of preservation, whereas the corresponding region in this area can be seen, you can pick it up actually if you look at it carefully instead of going by the numbers. So these are the two challenges that suggest a radical change should be made in the common clinical paradigm that the OCT uses and uh, maybe uh, visual fields which have include the finer test grids like 24-2C or 10-2 etc. should be need, uh, uh, actually equated with the OCT and seen in advanced cases. So are we in the middle of a paradigm shift? At a glance, clinicians need to confirm a few rules to accurate uh, cohen optical coherence tomography imaging before accepting the results. I've already told you about all that. And when assessing progression, you must determine whether the changes are clinically significant or not. Do not rely on the OCT. Always use your clinical eye before you label a patient as progressing. Thank you very much for your attention. The next speaker is uh, Dr. Shubrangshu Sengupta. Dr. Shubrangshu Sengupta is a prolific surgeon, a versatile teacher, and a senior consultant at the Center for Sight, Kolkata. Over to you, Dr. Shubrangshu Sengupta, for neurological OCT findings that mimic glaucoma. Is there a AV problem? So while we're waiting for him to uh, get ready with his slides, uh, I'll direct that question to you, Shushmita. What is the commonest uh, OCT pitfall that you've encountered? It's a long way to the microphone. <laughs> Yeah, so obviously the green is normal and red is, OCT, uh, is glaucoma. That's the commonest, of course. We have, all of us have clinics full of uh, patients referred because the OCT is red. So the most important thing is that a thin, uh, thinning due to any cause would result in a red flag, which would be AION, which might be a pituitary microadenoma, anything. But the other thing that we've learned over time is that topography is important. If you have a, a defect which is closer to the poles, you will have an RNFL loss. If you have a defect which is closer to the horizontal raphe, you will have a GCA loss with a normal RNFL. So that question of whether you should do GCA or you should do RNFL makes no sense. Because if you understand, that's the reason why NTG has deep central defects because the defect is closer to the papillomacular bundle and which is why NTG is blinding. And in those patients, even early on, you would start with a 10-2 and a GCA rather than 24-2 and RNFL. So that's just an example. Absolutely. So understanding the OCT is important than, you know, than any. And I like the fact that you showed that in some times, then the 24-2 is gone and you have a central. But I would follow all of these with 10-2 only. 
I wouldn't right. even order a 24-2. Absolutely. The other question is about 24-2C. It's important to understand that 24-2C, even if it has 10 extra points in the center, the strategy is faster. So it's only supra threshold. A perimetrically naive person is not going to understand a 24-2C. So it has Absolutely. to has to get over the learning curve with the 24-2 CETA standard, which is what we use. And once they understand that, the 24-2C is good enough. But combining an RNFL and GCA is a mandate in all patients. We always do that. Absolutely. Right? Thank you very much for those very, very important outputs. We move on to Dr. Uh, uh, Shubhrangshu Sengupta, all yours. Thank you, uh, Dr. Chandra Paul, ma'am, and AIOC for having me here. So I'll be speaking on neurological OCT findings that mimic glaucoma. So basically, I'll be just looking at two or three cases. So first is a 49-year-old non-hypertensive, non-diabetic male who's on topical uh, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors for the last two years. Open angles on gonioscopy applications are 18 and 20 with uh, 520, 530 microns central corneal thickness. So now when we look at the nerves, we can easily, uh, the first thing that strikes us is the palate that is there in this particular optic nerve head. So now we look at the OCT, uh, OCT RNFL shows the uh, total thinning in the left side and in the right side also there is advanced damage. So now when we look at the uh, perimetry, in the right eye we see that there is a uh, temporal hemifield defect and in the left eye the defect is much more diffuse. So now we know that we are definitely, when there is respecting of the horizon, uh, the vertical uh, midline, then we know that we are looking some at something beyond glaucoma. Also, the last clue, the vision in the left eye is 6 by 60, whereas in the right eye it's 6 9. So basically we were looking at a tumor compressing the pre segment of the left optic nerve, and hence these damages. Now, the second case. So the, here we have a 22-year-old engineering intern who was put on topical prostaglandin analogs for the last two years with unremarkable systemic history, normal gonioscopy, family history, father had POAG, AT was 16 and 15, and CCT was around 520 microns. So now, this is what the RNFL thickness looked like. So we have lots of areas of thinning here and here. So if we look closely at the situation, well, basically, this is what the optic discs look like. They don't look glaucometers, that's for sure. Now, f the final clue, the most important clue, rather, the refraction. Now, this patient is actually a high myope, 8.25 and 8 diaprospherical. Of course, the perimetry is normal. So basically, why all these reds and uh, yellows in the RNFL thickness? So as, we, as has been discussed briefly, we all know that patients with myopia have a decreased image size due to ocular magnification effects, leading to a smaller measured ONH, and hence an underestimation of the RNFL thickness. These patients often have blood vessels and RNFL arcuate bundles deviated more temporally. Like here you can see the bundles are deviated temporally. They should have been here. In normal people, they should have, this is where the RNFL bundle should have been, but they have been deviated temporally. As a result of which, there is an increase in the temporal RNFL thickness as a, and subsequently and consequently, there is a decrease in the superior and inferior thicknesses. And the RNFL peaks and arteries are shifted temporarily, resulting in, so basically these red arrows correspond to the peaks of the patient in question, and this black arrow is actually indicating where normally it should have been. So because these are shifted temporarily, therefore we have this superior and inferior thinning, and that is why we get all these red areas. Now the third case. So now we have a 24-year-old lady with uh, 16 and 17 IOP. Uh, CCT is on the higher side, 567 and 572. 
and uh, visual acuity is 6.9, little myopic, yes. When we look at the RNFL, here we see that there, there is basically thickening here. That is why, because it is beyond the normative database, that is why it's coming as white. And this is what the automated perimetry looks like. There is quite extensive uh, damage here. So what are we looking at? Definitely not glaucoma. So just a couple of considerations. So neuroophthalmic OCT considerations in the acute phase of insult to the optic nerve, for example, in ischemic optic neuropathies, there's swelling of the retinal ganglion cells, axons, which produce an increase in RNFL thickness, and therefore any axonal loss gets marked. In fact, we get thickening there. To circumvent this, the density of the retinal ganglion cell bodies, which are located in the inner retina, can be considered as long as there is no coexisting macular pathology. So therefore, the concept of the ganglion cell complex comes up. So basically, the GCIP is ganglion cell bodies plus the inner plexiform layer. So ganglion cell layer basically is this part. And the ganglion cell complex is the GCIP plus the RNFL, all three put together is the ganglion cell complex. And the macular GCIP can detect ganglion cell loss in the presence of ONH edema and in patients whose optic nerves are difficult to evaluate clinically and where RNFL thickness measurements become unreliable. So in, that part, in the same case that we were discussing, when we look at the macular GCC values, everything is in the red. So basically, what are we looking at? This was actually a patient of retinitis pigmentosa. So basically, has been advised for all the relevant tests, but uh, never followed up anyway, so. So just to summarize, OCT in ischemic optic neuropathy, there would be a superior and inferior asymmetry in OCT measurements. BRO, uh, the retinal issues will be taken up by the next speaker, will similarly produce a defect that respects the horizontal midline, but unlike NAION, the inner nuclear layer would be grossly thinned in a BRAO. So now the common neuroophthalmic conditions mimicking glaucoma with respect to various age groups in the young, we definitely need to look at hereditary, post-traumatic, inflammatory, and infectious diseases. In the middle age, obviously the compressive and vascular lesions, and in elderly, the GCA. Common symptoms that are associated in neuroophthalmic cases, that also we need to keep in our mind, like a sudden or uh, and a rapidly progressing diminution of vision, which is typically unilateral, there is red, red desaturation, other uh, symptoms like diplopia, orbital ache, and vision loss associated with headache. The signs, we look for proptosis, ptosis, loss in the central visual acuity without a loss in peripheral vision, central scotoma, pallor, RAPD, conjunctiv conjunctival chemosis, all these would indicate that there's something beyond glaucoma. To conclude, younger than, average, younger than the average glaucoma patient might not be a glaucoma patient at all. Look carefully for a neuroophthalmic disease. Pallor in excess of cupping indicates something other than glaucoma. We all know nothing notches a nerve like glaucoma. So if we get a notch, we know what we should be looking at and look for the typical neurological field defects. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shubhranshu. That was indeed very lucidly explained. We all have a thought block and mind block when it comes to neuroophthalmology. And uh, with those cases, you really brought home to us very lucidly how we can actually uh, differentiate it from glaucoma. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Dr. Anujit Paul. Dr. Anujit Paul did his vitreoretinal fellowship and is presently a consultant at the BBI Foundation. Uh, an assistant professor at the Vivekananda Institute of Medical Sciences and a visiting consultant at the B.R. Singh Hospital, Kolkata. Over to you, Dr. Anujit, to speak on retinal conditions that cause glaucomatous like OCT abnormalities. So thank you very much, madam, and thank you, AIOS, for this opportunity. So I will be speaking on retinal conditions, just a minute.
So I will be speaking on retinal conditions that mimic glaucoma. So for all this while, we've been focused on the optic disc and the changes in the optic disc and how they can or cannot mimic glaucoma. So for retina, I'd like everyone to just sit back and just focus away from the optic disc because as retina specialists, we have to look as far as the periphery for our diseases and we have to correlate all that with the findings that we have with our investigative modalities. So even on OCT, we usually see our glaucomatous damage happening in the inner retinal layers, but as retina specialists, we are more focused on the outer retina. And sometimes changes in the outer retinal layers, the photoreceptor layers, have an implication on the nerve fiber and the ganglion cell layer, and which is why a retinal disease can in fact mimic glaucoma. So once again, if you look at the fundus, there's a healthy optic nerve and there's an optic nerve with glaucoma, but not all of it is caused sometimes by ganglion cell loss. Not all of it is caused by changes in and around the papillary region. Sometimes changes in the macula along the arcades can also cause the retinal disease to mimic glaucoma. So other ways distinct retinal diseases, diseases can mimic glaucoma because of optic disc features, visual field defects, or OCT changes. So for the convenience, I've divided this presentation into retinal diseases that mimic on presentation and those that mimic on sequelae. So starting with those that mimic on presentation, we start with congenital anomalies of the optic disc. These are present right from birth. These include optic disc pit, optic disc pit coloboma, and morning glory syndrome. The fact that they mimic glaucoma is because of their large discs and the large cup, which is often misconstrued. So if you have a look at this photo, in general, it is a no-brainer photo for anyone sitting here. This is, in fact, a chorioretinal coloboma with a focal excavation of the retinochoroidal region inferiorly. But what if it presents like this? What if there is no other feature that is presenting? And this is when it can mimic glaucoma. So even though it is a bowl-shaped excavation inferiorly with some sharp borders, because of its non-progressive nature, in spite of being a mimic of glaucoma, we can differentiate it from glaucomatous cupping. Once again, I put to you another retinal disease. Once again, a very easy no-brainer. There is an optic disc pit, and this is very easily uh, demarkable on indirect or direct ophthalmoscopy. So, however, what if it presents like this? What if the pit is not really visible? What if there is an area of neurosensory detachment over here which is not sustainable and which cannot be detected if you're not seeing it on OCT? So even though on OCT this is not a mimic because we can see the subretinal fluid from the ODP, the disc feature sometimes mimics glaucoma and that is why we have to differentiate it with the OCT findings. Once again, another very, very common retinal feature this is unmistakably morning glory syndrome, a funnel-shaped excavation of the disc with spoke-like vessels extending from the disc to the periphery with a central glial tuft. But what if this patient presents to you with a picture like this? It looks like a large disc. There, is, there may or may not be a central glial tuft, sometimes easily visible. There's increased number of radial blood vessels which may not be visible, and this annular area of peripapillary atrophy may not be discernible. This is when conditions like morning glory syndrome can also perplex even a diagnostician to wonder whether this patient also has glaucomatous cupping. Another very simple retinal finding, there are multiple lumpy, bumpy features that I can, I'm pointing out over here. And this is quite easily optic disdrusen. These are the FAF and red free mages that show the same thing. But sometimes when there are a few, and when it is focal, when it is not easily discernible, so an irregular looking disc with a lumpy bumpy appearance somewhere in the peripheral portion of the cup disc margin can sometimes mimic glaucoma. Over here, a red-free photograph, or like the OCT I showed you in the previous photo, can help us discern it, it from glaucoma. Superior and inferior field effects can also help in differentiating these as well as its progressive nature, which is not there with the retinal anomaly. Some more very easy uh, fundus features on presentation. So this is a large disc with a large cup with an area of peripapillary atrophy with a tigroid fundus, RP changes in the macula, thinning where you can see the sclera. 
this is unmistakably pathological myopia. But sometimes when the pathological myopia is not clearly discernible, there is not enough features to differentiate it, myopia also becomes a very important differential and a very important mimicker of primary open angle glaucoma. So increased ri risk of primary open angle glaucoma is also seen in myopic eyes. Large disc with a shallow cup with a shallow neuroretinal limb. Tilted disc with peripapary atrophy and gross tessellation are some other features. These discs may also have very distinct visual field defects that mimic glaucoma, including arcuate field defects and large blind spots due to the area and region of atrophy. So moving on from those that mimic glaucoma, those retinal conditions that mimic glaucoma on presentation, we go to those that mimic on sequelae. That means otherwise normal, clearly discernible retinal features over time are confused for glaucoma. So the easiest one is retinitis pigmentosa. So retinitis pigmentosa will ideally present with one of the three findings, but diagnostically, we all know the triad of vaccidis paler, arterial attenuation, and bony spicules. Sometimes the glaucomatous field effect of a constricted field can confuse us whether this disease is glaucoma or not. However, the triad will always help us differentiate RP from any glaucoma. Another very important differential are vascular occlusions. So vascular occlusions on presentation are very, very distinct. I don't think anyone would mistake it for glaucoma. But however, if you go into the sequel of a vascular occlusion uh, and go for the go for a HVF of the patient, it will show you sometimes an arcuate field effect, which you will not find in glaucomatous patients. So following up these patients help differentiate otherwise vascular occlusions from glaucoma. Another very important feature is uh, post for pan retinal photocoagulation because of the extensive area of lasered retina, sometimes field effects. If we do not have a look at the fundus or the periphery beyond the arcades, we may confuse the Humphrey visual field for something that may give us an idea of glaucoma. So there has been a lot of studies that have debated on the amount of RNFL loss after PRP. Uh, some studies concluding that the RNFL becomes significantly thinner so this also raises a level of suspicion when you're comparing it in glaucomatous patients who already are expected to have thinner RNFLs. Finally, there is the last condition following, retin following any retinal disease that is optic atrophy, which can happen even after neurological conditions. So it's very important to differentiate, as Ma'am has already said, the extent of pallor is a very important factor to differentiate optic atrophy due to other conditions versus that of glaucoma. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Anujit. That was a great talk on an, uh, retinal disorders mimicking glaucoma and uh, definitely a very informative one as well. So uh, we'll move on to uh, a take home message, maybe a two liner from each of the speakers on your topic. We'll start with Dr. Choudhury. What would you give your take home message for those diagnosing glaucoma where they have an excess to OCT? I believe excess. When there is access to the OCT, my take-home measures always go for the clinical findings also. Don't be biased on the OCT. Number one, because there are some fallacies are always there. In every machine, there is some good or some bad effect is there. And OCT has, most of them are the good one, but it has a fallacy, it has to be taken care of. So the clinical findings has to be taken as for the disc findings and others, before interpreting the case of the glaucoma. Thank you very much. As we always say, that clinical diagnosis actually uh, is the priority. OCT is just an aid to diagnose glaucoma or even detect the progression of glaucoma. Uh, Dr. Shweta Tripathi, would you please give your inputs? So as I uh, pointed out in my own presentation that there is a, a schematic or I can say a, 
rule which we have to follow when we do the optic disc evaluation. Like you start with the scleral ring, then you come to the uh, NRR health. Then you talk about that, what, where do you see those baby vessels emerging out? It is not about that yellow color which you see and you say that it's a cup and the other remaining portion is disc and the uh, NRR is there, no. You have to look at and concentrate at the baby vessels. So that's how, and then when you see, and then you see in your beginning phase that ISNT rule has been followed or not. This is how you can evaluate the disc correctly instead of simply going and saying, and also always compare the disc size. Whenever you say that it's a, a cupping uh, increased or decreased, always have an association with the proportionate size of the disc, which is really important. And along with that, look and go for the uh, pallor as well to say that whether it's a glaucomatous cupping or cupping due to any other reason. And as I have already said, it's a neuropathy which is manifesting as cupping. It's not the disease itself, it's a manifestation of the disease. Thank you. Thank you very much. Over to you, Dr. Shubranshu. Uh, uh, I'm very much in tune with Dr. what Dr. Chaudhary said. Uh, clinical evaluation of the patient is most important. In all the three cases that I discussed briefly in my presentation, these were patients who were put on, prost on uh, various anti-glaucoma medications based on OCT, uh, based on perimetry findings. Uh, like no one bothered to check the, the retina properly, no one probably did a dilated examination and hence they were putting drops for something and they had some other disease. Second is whenever we are looking at any neuroophthalmic situation, like we always uh, tell people that uh, pallor out of proportion of cupping definitely points towards a neuroophthalmic disease. And similarly, you, you know, in perimetry, if there's something that is respecting the vertical midline, then definitely we would have to think of something uh, neuroophthalmic. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Dr. Anujit? So uh, just to reiterate what Sir initially said, so usually pres uh, retinal diseases that on presentation with glaucoma are no-brainers, but however on sequelae, for example, if you have a retinal vein occlusion, many years later that is just a couple of sclerose vessels that you can see in the temporal periphery. So proper documentation of these findings, having a second look at the fundus whenever you have a doubt can help you differentiate especially diseases like vascular occlusions, which is very commonly, and post-laser PRPs that can mimic glaucoma on visual fields. So always have a second look at the funders before you interpret a uh, visual field, if you have a doubt. Thank you very much. And uh, is there any question from the audience? And yes, please. Any variation in the optic disc in cases of uh, normal tension glaucoma or low tension glaucoma? Uh, I'd like Dr. Saitan to please answer that. I can see him there. Dr. Saitan. You didn't hear the question? Yeah, can you just repeat the question? He's there. Can you just repeat your question once, please? Yeah. Dr. Saitan is right there. How about optic disc variation in cases of normal tension or low tension glaucomas compared to the uh, other situation where the pressure is high and we know about the uh, disc changes? Optic disc variations, I'm not clear what exactly is the question. Optic, optic, optic disc, disc, disc variations, variations in, in normal tension glaucoma. I don't know what, what exactly, I am not able to understand. Optic disc what variations is, means. Can you come yeah. down? Is it a masquerading that you are saying or optic uh, no. disc variations in uh, NTG? Optic disc variations in NTG, if there is any uh, apart from... Vis-a-vis uh, glaucoma, vis-a-vis yeah. vis full-blown glaucoma. The only, only thing is I can say about RNFL rather than optic disc variation. RNFL pattern is little different in a NTG which is more closer to the papillomacular bundle. That much I can tell you. But is there a change in the optic disc? I am not sure. But RNFL, yes, definitely. The pattern of the RNFL is more closer to the, uh, the papillomacular bundle. That is one thing which we can really say. The second thing is probably the disc hemorrhages are much more uh, common to see in a 
NTG pattern. Uh, other than that, the cup part of it is almost, I mean, same, same as uh, what you see in your uh, regular uh, open angle lockum. I won't say it is like uh, angle closed or this is. But what are the what are the parameters to set target pressure in such situations? Low tension or normal tension? See, in the normal tension lockum, again, it is depending upon one type of NTG is like a non-progressive type. You have another one is a progressive type. In the progressive type, you keep it somewhere around 20 to 25 percent as the minimum target pressures, but having said that, it is not that every patient will be getting arrested by that uh, 20 or 25 percent IOP drop. So there's a lot of variables that we have to look into. Yeah. So we have some glaucoma I'm not stalwarts. sure whether uh, I'm yeah, answering yeah, this. That's uh, all right. I'll, I'll just uh, move on to the, we have some glaucoma stalwarts in the hall. Dr. Shushmita is there. Could you add something to it? Dr. Tanuj is there. Dr. Murli is there. If you want to add something to that, please. Yeah, I will give the point to them. Yeah. <laughs> I think where optic disc changes are concerned, of course, optic disc hemorrhages would be more uh, common in normal tension in glaucoma, here. and you have uh, more of an ischemic etiology rather than mechanical. So sometimes they might appear a little more pale, yes. and the defects are more towards the horizontal, as we've just talked about, rather than the poles. And therefore, there are central deep defects which reflect in the OCT in the GCA going before the RMSL. Absolutely. Dr. Murli, would you like to add something to that? Normal tension glaucoma and POAG. Mainly yeah, disc yeah, features. Yeah. Thank you for that. Basic interest in uh, looking at the disc in glaucoma, I think, is very, very important that you diagnose the glaucoma based on the disc appearance. There are certain very typical features of glaucoma looking at the optic disc. We all know that. We teach the classic notch in the rim, the bi bipolar notch, the RNFL defects, the increase in peripapillary atrophy, you watch for the progression, and so on. What you can say is maybe typical NTG. So NTG basically would mean some kind of maybe a circulatory disturbance, something to do with the blood flow as well. So that's why maybe you can s probably find uh, disc hemorrhages appearing on and off and then going away over, over time. So serial disc photography and looking at the pictures over time will probably tell you the sequence of coming and going and then what's actually happening as a vascular episode in that optic nerve. Otherwise, there's nothing really specific in terms of, say, giving it a high, high degree of specificity and saying that this particular disc is typically NTG or this disc is something else. It's very difficult to say. It's a lot of subjective uh, subjectivity with that. You can't really conclusively say, looking at the disc, this is NTG and so on. It's all put together, the open angle, the intraocular pressure, the diagonal variation, the typical nature of what you see on the disc, the correlation with the field, all put together is a clinical picture of NTG. Yeah, so uh, you could not actually, you cannot actually differentiate it uh, on a straight line basis with primary open angle glaucoma, but definitely NTGs have more notches, disc hemorrhages, and of course, the intraocular pressure is much lower. That's how we think that it's an NTG because the intraocular pressure is lower than primary open angle glaucoma, basically. Anybody else? Do you want to add anything? Anybody from the uh, talk? Yes, please. Carry on. Um, hello. I just have another question. Is it uh, go okay to go ahead? Yes, please. Go ahead. Um, if uh, OCTs are, uh, now that OCTs are available in our uh, regular clinics, if there's a situation where all my other parameters seem stable, like for say the IOP is fine and uh, the disc looks same as the last visit and the visual field seems to be stable, but the OCT, RNFL and GC, or either both of them, the RNFL and GCC is showing a progression or one of them, one of those parameters is showing a progression, do I take that as progression and modify the management or do we, looking at the whole picture, because if I didn't have OCT available, everything else would have looked stable and I would have probably not modified the uh, medication. What, what do we do in such a scenario? Yeah, so what would you do in that dilemma, Dr. Chaudhary? The question is uh, something tricky is that, that you don't have OCT, the treatment is different. If you have OCT, the treatment is different, is it? No, no. Uh, you know, if knowing that if I didn't have the OCT, yes. I know that everything is stable. But now that I've seen the OCT, RNFL, or the GCC, which I had available, uh, I can see progression in just the OCT 
RNFL or the GCC analysis, but everything else, like the IOP, the optic nerve, or the visual field, all the other parameters which we usually look at when we are thinking of progression look stable. Even at that point, do we modify the treatment or do we wait for another visit? Yes, there is a, there's one thing. Yeah. I, yes, I didn't want to speak. I would not modify the treatment. Sure. I would wait for follow-up, but with ESPs. Uh, Dr. Dr. Shushmita, Dr. Seth, and both of them yeah, yeah. want to speak here. Yeah. Actually, it is a good question. Everything else is okay. The optic disc appears fine. The visual fields appears fine. Only the OCT is showing a change. But in that way, I would really look at whether is it really true that the disc findings of your subjective examination is okay or not. That is first thing. Second thing is visual fields again is subject to a lot of variables. That is, so I just take it as definitely it is okay. And only the OCT is showing the change. When you're doing the OCT, especially when you're looking at the GCL, it, again, it depends upon the which equipment which you are using. Say, for example, you are using the spectralis, which gives you one to two micron variability. And when you're using the others, I don't want to name any other company. It gives you a variance of about eight to 10 microns in the GCL map. So when you have a, such a variability, the company itself gives you, if it is the change is between eight to 12 or eight to 10 micron change, then you say there is a progression over a period of time. If it is not so, then there is no real progression happening. But the variability of about 25 to 30 percent, you got to be extremely careful about reading your OCT. So that will be my very short and uh, crisp answer for that. If it is really giving a significant change, like 15 micron change or more than, or more than 12 micron change in a different kind of OCT, but in spectralis it is of course a little different. Even spectralis gives you minimum change of about eight microns, then you say there is a possible progression. We are not saying it is a progression. We are saying a possible progression in that. So no. Like Satyan better. Okay. So even a change in signal strength will get lead to progression. And increased cataract would lead to progression. So the OCT has to be looked at that the parameters were exactly the same before, you know, you do it on the same day, you put in a lubricant and the, the red will become an orange and an orange might become a green again. So but still having said all that and if everything else is fine, if I see a change in OCT, it would make me follow up the patient a little closer because it might not be confirming a visual field progression today, but maybe if we saw it four months down the line, it would. But like Satyan said, we are definitely wary of, you know, having a knee-jerk reaction and treating. So unless, once you see change, it's an indication that, okay, just, just keep a watch on him. But functional progression is, would be when I would change. Thank you, Shushmita. Thank and you so much. Can I just add on to that? It's yes, please. The other, uh, it's the other side of it. Yes. Um, just asking the dilemmas that I actually face. Um, if if the OCT is fine, the, and the, the OCT is fine, the IOP is fine, and the disc looks fine, and sometimes we come across the visual field, which is not reliable, uh, not very reliable. It's you know, it looks like the same, it's not absolutely heavy that it doesn't uh, look like the last pattern, it does. And that is showing some progression, but at the same time, it is not reliable. At that point, do we just repeat it and wait, or do we, we would repeat it and repeat wait? And wait. Yes, okay. definitely, we'd repeat the visual field, maybe the next day or after a couple of days, and then we move on from there. Yes. Yes. I want to add yeah. something else. Yes. Look yeah. at the pupil size, when you go for a repeat. Okay. You have, to, we have to see the particular people said before and after that also. There are lots of fallacies come. It's a minute dead changes there. Yeah. So the technician part is very important in this case also. And always differentiate between a pseudo progression and a true progression, what ma'am was telling. Yeah. That's really important because uh, before you stamp anybody as a progressive disease, go for at least minimum of two or three fields or OCT, whatever you are thinking 
that is showing progress and if that is consistent in all the visits and you have cleared out all the media and everything then label it as a progressive uh, disease and then you can take the measures but solely depending on any technology and changing your uh, treatment regime uh, is uh, not recommended thank you so much thank you <coughs> any other questions or else we'll wrap up we just have another four minutes i think so no more questions Thank you very much, my co-instructors. Thank you very much, the glaucoma stalwarts in the hall and everybody else for being a part of this course. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Can we have a photograph? Yes.